Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Daniel Glass on EastVillageRadio.com, and uh, today, high expectations, high drama in the studio because we put together what I think is a dream show of independent entrepreneurs who are controlling the destiny in the indie label scene. Uh, we conceived this show a few months ago, and then it just sort of came together in the last few weeks, and uh, I'm just honored and thrilled to have three gentlemen here who are um, in control of their destinies at uh, three very unique, artistic, uh, full of integrity labels, which I respect. And um, this show, as all our shows, are produced by Adam Herzog. And uh, just to introduce you to who's on the show today is A-Track, who's here both as a DJ, artist, and obviously the head of Fool's Gold record company, Sid Butler, who's here as an artist and also the head of French Kiss Records, and Jonathan Galkin, who's here as one of the principals running one of the great companies, DFA. And again, we try and keep this show as uh, New York-centric as possible and give you a slice of the history of what goes on in the streets of New York City and establishing genres and scenes and the DJ community and the producer community. So today is going to be a special treat. We're going to discuss uh, from the independent label entrepreneurial uh, spirit the inspirations and motivations of getting started and uh, basically going back to the history of how these three great record companies of Fool's Gold, DFA and French Kiss started. And uh, I'm going to start with A-Track to discuss the beginning a Fool's Gold, and uh, he'll introduce a song. Sure. Uh, Fool's Gold was founded um, in 2007, and the label is basically myself and my partner Nick Catchdubs. We're both DJs. Uh, it's an artist-run label. It's a DJ-run label. And uh, I was already uh, familiar with the process of running an independent label because uh, I used to run another label before called Audio Research, which was an indie hip-hop label around more around the late 90s. And... Uh, I mean, basically around that time when we started the label, uh, there was a really burgeoning scene among our DJ friends. When I say our, I mean myself and Nick. Uh, you know, a lot of our friends were making new, interesting club music that was somewhere between electronic music and, and, and hip hop. And in that sense, I think there was two, two um, I would say, groups of labels that really influenced us in, in starting Fool's Gold. One in, in, in that aesthetic of, of, of uh, being able to release side by side a rap le record and a dance record, you know, I would definitely reference uh, older New York labels from, from Sleeping Bag to Nervous, uh, you know, who could put out a freestyle or, or, or a dance record and, 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 a, and, a, and a rap record in the same breath. And then there's another dimension to Fool's Gold, which is um, this sort of like strongly branded, aesthetically very present uh you know hopefully as consistent as as possible label and in that sense i would say you know we were very influenced by labels like stone throw uh mo wax uh, and even some of our peers like ed banger for example i mean just labels where you recognize the cover as you see a new cover in a, in a, in a store you know that that's a fool's gold record and and hopefully that the fans buy everything we put out just because we put it out and I mean that's that's that was something that that's very important to us even raucous in the indie rap era I think also um, and we started Fool's Gold basically when uh, I started making music with uh, with Kid Sister um, and uh, that was the catalyst to starting the label when we had a Kid Sister single that was ready to come out and Nick and I said alright well let's start this label and do it that was the birth of Fool's Gold and I think we're going to hear now that first single uh, which is controlled by Kid Sister. Okay, we're going to move to uh, to Sid Butler. Uh, very interesting beginning of of a great record company, and uh, I'm just curious for Sid to talk about the the hats that he was wearing at the time. I'd love to know exactly being the artist, uh, bass player, everything you are. So it's uh, this is an interesting story. Um, well, I grew up in Washington D.C. and I was sort of spoiled during the time of Discord, um, and I would go and be a Discord brat and hang out at Discord and go to all the shows back then and, and uh, one of my biggest influences uh, in this business um, was Ian MacKay and, and the philosophy of Discord um, and sort of an inspiration was, uh, was Fugazi and just how they treated themselves, treated the audience and, um, and their persona as a band. Um, so the song I like to play is Blueprint. 
um, off of uh, repeater. Thank you. Jonathan Galkin now to talk about the beginnings of, uh, of DFA, the inspiration, motivation, influences, and the early, early history. Jonathan? Uh, well, I, I met J- uh, James Murphy of LCD Sound System and Tim Goldsworthy, who had uh, uh, left Moax Records, where he was a founder, um, and had moved to New York City. He had met James, and they had um, started. James had already um, started a studio in the West Village, where Tim, um, Tim, and he had met, um, recording an album by David Holmes. And um, once David left, Tim decided to stay in America, and they started working with um, bands that James was connected to. James had actually recorded uh, Sid's band, La Savi Fav, their very first record, where Pat Mahoney, who became the drummer in LCD Sound System, was the drummer with La Savi Fav. There's a lot of um, the good incest, as you called it, um, there. And um, from those roots, um, Tim, Tim introduced um, a lot of dance music that he had brought over from England. Um, and um, James um, was also himself becoming a, quite a DJ and, and getting into dance music. And I met them um, through a mutual friend, and those guys were producing brilliant music, but were the first to admit that they really wanted to release this but had absolutely no idea where to even start and would spend their days basically staring at each other in a room wondering what to do and uh i begged and begged my way in um after i had heard some music they were working on that no one else had heard including house of jealous lovers by the rapture um which became the first single we ever released um and i said i I had a job at the time where i was making a very comfortable salary and i said i will quit my job if and just you know, just if you will let me run this label and, you know, give me a year. We went after some investment money and we had the studio was our asset. And, the, and these two guys, James and Tim, and there were two, there were a bunch, a few bands that they were working with at the time. One was The Rapture, um, who became our first um, real success story that put us on the map. And that first single, House of Dust Lovers, really uh, meant a lot to a lot of people around the world and changed a lot in the, in the DJ world and in the indie world. And, the same time, they were also working with uh, a band called Pixeltan um, um, from the, uh, uh, the RISD scene, um, where a lot of bands were coming out of. Um, and the drummer for Pixeltan is a drummer in uh, Black Dice, who signed to DFA Records. And um, one friend kept leading to another. But this Pixeltan music, the bands really couldn't agree to disagree even, to just let it be released. And it kind of sat there for a few years until finally in around 2004... And we launched the label in 2001. They let us release their first single, which had actually been recorded before we even did the Rapture stuff. And, uh, and now, coming out um, before the end of this year, we have a brand new EP from Pixel Tan, um, and it marks our 100th release, which is incredibly appropriate. Um, so I was going to uh, preview something today called Yamarena Eye from Pixel Tan.